and welcome to another special edition of Chips With Everything, where once again we've searched the archives of the most frequently asked questions and the most memorable moments. The enormous dimension of the Chips mailbag is a constant burden to our postman, so if you're one of the many people who sends us questions that we've already answered, sit up straight, concentrate and make it a New Year's resolution to never miss another edition again. Anyway, before I start a full-scale war between our two teams, let's get on with the show. First tonight is a question from Jamie Heaveside in Middlesbrough. He wrote and said, Dear Kate and team, I do a lot of photo editing using my scanner, and for top-quality photos, I use a high resolution. Unfortunately, this leads to a high file size, and therefore, when I want to edit my photos, it takes a long time for each operation to occur, and the HD light flashes like crazy. I tried to try to solve this problem, I increased my 32 meg of RAM to 64 meg of RAM. This did not seem to solve the problem. Large files still run slowly, and if anything, it seems to take my PC longer to boot up and shut down. My hard drive is FAT32 formatted, so is this relevant to my memory? Should I have FAT64? Or are there any changes I should make to my file system? I have a P233 MMX Fujitsu PC, so could you please help me to solve this problem? Yours sincerely, Jamie Heaveside. Jamie, Fat64, I like that idea, don't you, Roger? I think he's jumping the gun a little bit here. Can you just briefly explain what, what is, because it can be very confusing actually, Fat16, Fat32. Fat16 is the mean? old um, file system that uh, DOS uh, uh, and the first versions of Windows 95 used, but um, um, it was designed for sort of to cope with smaller hard, hard disks, and when hard disks got about two gigabytes, um, using Fat16, it led to a... Um, uh, very inefficient use of the uh, of the space, and so you get a lot of wasted or slack space on on the hard disks. It's to, right. to do with the large cluster sizes. Fat32 reduced the cluster size down to 4K. So it allows so you to use more of the hard drive. Much more efficient. Much more efficient. Storage. The downside of that is that uh, because the cluster size drops, there's loads more more uh, clusters to deal deal with. So, so your it, maintenance the, and so general if, speed. you know if you've got to sort of get if previously a, a file was a thousand clusters, it would now be 30,000 clusters, so it's a bit longer to uh, load. Um, so there's a problem there. I mean, um, FAT32 so can be slight, slightly slower at loading very large files. Right. Um, he could try adding yet more RAM. 64 meg may not be enough. Do we say this, don't we? Actually, I'm going to go over to Aaron, you, Aaron, on this one. Um, <clears throat> 32 meg it used to be you know really a lot of ram now it's it's nothing is it no especially not for photo manipulation yeah so you would and suggest as well and more if he is using large bitmap files mm -hmm. yeah go up to 128 mm -hmm. it, it will make a difference no question and if it doesn't make a difference then there's something else that needs addressing right you you're you're yeah, still yeah i mean memory's cheap isn't it i mean you can get 64 megs for i don't know 50 quid now so how about going scuzzy would that make a difference um, scuzzy scan um it would certainly speed up uh, the scanning operation and the transfer of, of, of files if he's doing high resolution uh, with a lot of colour depth. Yeah. So it's costly worth looking option, at. Though. Yeah, costly option. Well, it all comes down to how much you're prepared to spend for your either work or pleasure on your computer. I'm afraid that's the same with most things these days. There's several solutions there from our uh, experts, and hopefully that's FAT32 and FAT16 explained also. Now, second question this evening is supplied by David Painting. He wrote and said, Dear Kate and team, I have a software problem. I use MS Excel both at home and at work, and sometimes I need to take files home. I thought that using my briefcase was the ideal answer, and this all worked all right until I tried to create a chart, and I noticed that the chart menus were greyed out. No matter what I did, I couldn't create a chart. In desperation, I broke the links with the briefcase, and the entire chart menus returned, and the charts were created. But as you will probably guess, I could no longer keep the files synchronised. Is there any way that I can create charts and keep the files synchronised between work and home? Hoping you can help David Painting. Well, it's a good question, David. First of all, I'm going to come to Roger and I'll start, basically explain the process that um, David's trying to do here. Briefcase is a little uh, utility. In fact, it's, it's, it's not a little bag. It's a little thing on your desktop, right? And um, you drag files that you want um, uh, to be synchronised into brief, briefcase and then from briefcase onto the, the floppy so that... Um, when you come back in the morning, you bring the, the uh, floppy disk in, transfer yeah. the files to briefcase, and they'll sy synchronise with the files on the hard, hard disk so that you've always got an up-to-date version. The most current version is always the one that you right. use. However, briefcase breaks down a little bit when you're involved with a network because um, when you are connected to a network, you don't automatically have read and write permissions to every, every single file on the, the network. And um, to, um, to use 
to be able to reconcile X, X, Excel files, files, you basically must be able to have write permissions, yeah, right. which you don't necessarily have on a network, but you do have it in a standalone, a standalone PC. PC. So, so that is the problem, probably, the network. So, yeah, so he's, he's got some, uh, several choices. He can either copy the file off the network to his PC and then use briefcase, but again, you've got a question of synchronise between the PC and the, yeah. the, the network. You can ha uh, ask the network administrator to um, perhaps uh, give you... Uh, read write permission privileges. to that file or you can um, just clear the read only at attribute on the file um, which prevents it from being changed and that so it's you know it's a it's a messy messy yeah. thing briefcase and networks i'm going to ask you a very quick i'm, I'm sorry aaron i'm going to have sorry, to pause again i'm going to ask you a very quick i just went on <laughs> i just love listening to it i just went on and very on and on quickly though the f f for our future question does it mean we're going to be using floppy disks a long time into the future as they seem to be a fairly integral floppy part disks, of the system no 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 when we when we have permanent connection to the internet we don't need to transfer files on floppy disks we just we're all going to be plugged in via our temples yeah. to the internet aren't exactly we? Oh, let's hope not. Well, I hope that answers your question for you. I can't remember what he said because he waffled on so much, but if he didn't Ooh. answer, just get back <coughs> in touch. So much for those frequently asked questions, but what about the non-techie stuff? What about the warm human face of the show? Yes, I'm afraid it does creep in. Now, next is an email from Newcastle upon Tyne. David Skelly has written in with a rather intriguing problem. He wrote and said, Dear Kate and panel, I have a Packard Bell 907 Pentium PC with Windows 95 as my operating system. I recently installed some software onto my PC, which operates in conjunction with the airband radio. When setting up the software, it asked me to select a COM port on which I wish to link the radio to my PC. I'm given a choice of comms 1 to 4 or other. The problem is that I'm unable to determine which devices are running on which COM port. And to add to the problem, the software will definitely not run if the COM port that I have selected shares its IRQ setting with another COM port. The only other devices that I've connected to my PC are a printer connected to LPT1 and a flatbed scanner which is connected to its own parallel port and an internal modem which I do know is using COM2. This leaves me wondering what, what is using COM ports 1 and 3. Could you possibly give, all of, give me some advice to try and identify what is using on my PC and also how I can go about solving the COM port conflicts? So, Roger, <laughs> it was a long question. Lots of COM ports, 1, 2, 3, 4. Mm, um, we need to sort out exactly what's going on here. What, well, what COM he, port should we choose? Well, he, he's, uh, he's quite right that uh, uh, the COM ports do share what's called an IRQ line. Um, COM port 1 and COM port 3 use IRQ4 and COM port 2 and COM port 4 use IRQ3. Okay, now, that means that if he's got his mouse plugged into COM1, which I suspect he has, he can't use 3 because they share an, an IRQ, and he's got an internal modem on COM2, which is sharing an IRQ with COM4. So he can't use 4 either, strictly speaking. However, it might be possible for him to put it on COM4 because um, COM, the uh, modem won't be in use all, all the time, so the IRQ will not be grabbed all the time, so that it may be spare. He just can't use the modem and his, uh, his airband radio thing at the same time. So it can actually share the COM ports if they're not actually not active at the same that's time? That's right, that's, that's a possibility. So COM port 4 might be the answer, Aaron, do you agree? <laughs> it's straight this over your head, me. isn't it? Not a clue. Um, no, I'll completely hand this one across to Roger. I'm sure he's right on this. Well, I think Roger's done a fine job of explaining comports to I'm us. Paid and to it. IRQs, of course. Um, so try Comport 4. We think that might be the way to go about it, but you're not going to be able to use your modem and your airband radio at the same time because that will have a problem with the IRQ sharing. If that doesn't work, then write to me and I'll let Roger know personally and we'll get him back again and drag him over the coals. Now, finally tonight, a question which cropped up regularly on chips provided by Ian Vestra. He wrote and said, Hello, CWE. I have a question regarding Windows 98. I've recently upgraded from my PC from Win95 to Win98 and would like to remove IE4 and the active desktop in particular. Do you know if this is a possible or not? Regards, Ian. OK, well, I know we have this question quite a lot on the show. Um, Aaron, I'm going to come to you, though. This is sort of like a bone of contention with a lot of people that you buy Windows 98 and it has integrated into it sort of like all these systems and everything that, that you use for surfing the web, managing your hard drive, whatever. What happens if you don't want them? If you don't want IE4 and you've upgraded to 98, you can kind of get rid of it, but it's very difficult to get rid of it completely. 
Um, if you do really want to get rid of it completely, then Microsoft Knowledge Base, something like that, should be able to help you. But tell you how bear to. In it mind is it, a very complicated I4 procedure. I4 is deeply, it? deeply embedded within the operating system. Right. It's. I don't use IE4 myself, but yeah. if you're using Windows 98 to its full capacity, IE4 does add some great features. There's no getting away from that. But if you don't want it, it's a different kettle of fish. How about the Active Desktop? Is that the same well, thing? That, that's an easy one. If you just right click on the desktop and then select Active Desktop Properties, I think it is, you can turn off the Active mm. Desktop. Ah, OK. So that mm. solves that part of the problem. Mm. Roger. Mm. I mean, we're at, Microsoft are actually in court at the moment, aren't they, as well, the dock, over yeah. this because of the Department of Justice looking yeah. at whether or not it's fair for them to have such yeah. a hold on the market. Yeah, it's, it's, it's because they were very sort of late converts to the idea that the internet is a good thing. And um, in order to get market share, they decided to give away Internet Explorer uh, to grab market share from Netscape Navigator. And of course, ah. uh, Do you not think that perhaps this is just getting a tad on the uh, erring on the side of bashing the popular sort of like successful company, or do you really think that there's justification? Bashing in it? the popular monopolist, you mean? <laughs> well, you see, there's two sides of the coin, isn't there? I mean, they've been highly successful. Mm. Um, they certainly have uh, delivered what people want. But in doing so, they've been very, very aggressive, and okay. they, they, you know, they, they scruples. They may well end up paying for it as well. We'll have to watch this space and find out. Well, there you go. It's easy to turn off your active desktop. But you can do it in the way that Aaron described. And uh, as for IE4, check out the Microsoft Knowledge Base and find out exactly how to do it. But that is quite, quite complicated. <laughs> Well, that's it for now. I'll be back next time with more classic questions and magic moments. I'll see you then. Goodbye.